Everybody, good evening, and thank you for joining me for a program which is going to cover liturgical and sacred music in the Romantic period. So in our last two lectures, we've looked at first Bach, and then last week we looked at Mozart and Beethoven. And we said that, yes, of course, the musical style changed. That much we know. Obviously, in the, the days of Johann Sebastian Bach, we have music dominated by counterpoint, by independent woven lines which fit together in what we call a polyphonic texture. And we said that Bach, really, in, when it comes to music and faith, Bach ticks all of the boxes, right? Because he lived in an era where, especially where he was in central Germany, it's a bit loud, yeah? Especially where Bach was in central Germany, remember Bach was born in a town called Eisenach, and spent much of his career in the town, then a town, now a city called Leipzig. And this was a town dominated by a particular strain of Lutheranism, which theologians sometimes refer to as pietist Lutheranism. In other words, Bach lived in a deeply, deeply religious period of history in that particular pocket of Europe. And then we said that when we get to Mozart, things are changing. And we said that Mozart's lifespan coincides with an era that historians refer to, of course, as the Enlightenment period. And because it's the Enlightenment period, it means necessarily that there are going to be certain beliefs, certain, certain call it ethos, which is endemic to that period, which is not really compatible with the sort of dogmatic faith to which uh, Bach adhered. In other words, Mozart wasn't as religious as Bach, but that might have not had anything to do with their personalities. It might have been, I think you could make the argument, that this was just time and place. That if you lived in Vienna in the 1780s, it's very different from living in, for example, Leipzig of the 1720s and 1730s. So Bach, a deeply religious, deeply spiritual man, and whose works, by the way, include over 200 cantatas, most of which are on sacred subjects. Not all of them are. Some of you may be familiar with the coffee cantata or the hunt cantata. So not all Bach cantatas are sacred pieces, but most are. When we get to Mozart, we said last week that Mozart, who's, by the way, catalog numbers about 625 pieces in what's known as the Kirchelverzeichnis. Say that 10 times fast. The, the Kirchel catalog, and we said that among that catalog, we find examples, in fact, I would suggest a very respectable number of mass settings, almost 20 mass settings by Mozart. But it's also fair to say that those pieces are not what he's known for. Mozart's known for his operas. He's known for his symphonies, his string quartets, and other chamber works, and of course, his piano music, including his sonatas and 27 concerti, to which... Um, Almost all are attributed to him. Probably 25 were written purely by Mozart. So what happens when we get into the Romantic period, this period that historians, this, this term, I should say, people use to describe music in the 19th century, in the century post-Beethoven? Well, we ended with Beethoven last week, and we said that Beethoven probably, I think it's fair to say, not a very religious person. Certainly, he did not always behave like what we might think of as a charitable Christian. Let me give you some examples. Beethoven had a really ugly feud with his sister-in-law when his brother died. He had gotten it into his head that he should be the custodian, shall we say, of his nephew Karl von Beethoven. In order to do this, he had to pry the child away from his sister-in-law, that is to say, the child's mother. I think it's fair to say that Beethoven behaved abominably in this situation. And it's difficult for us when I say us, I mean people who like Beethoven, which is people, in my experience, most people who like music like Beethoven. It's, it's difficult for us to talk about this period of Beethoven's life because he seems to be acting so immorally, so callously, in a way that might be described anywhere on the spectrum from simply mean-spirited and ignorant to really, really callous and, uh, and sinister. He really seems to have gone to excessive lengths to drag his sister-in-law's name through the mud because he realized that the only way he was going to get control of this poor child, Karl von Beethoven, was to make the mother look like a promiscuous, wayward strumpet that couldn't be trusted. And if you depict her that way, you accomplish the two things you want to accomplish. One, which is 
get control of your nephew, but I think also by way of what we might call collateral damage, ruining this poor woman's life. And Johanna von Beethoven suffered terribly in these years where she was forcibly separated by court order from her son, who was growing up to be a teenager. By the way, Karl von Beethoven would attempt suicide. He did not succeed. The bullet apparently caromed off of his skull, which Beethoven had a persnickety remark, told the teenager, I always knew you were a bad shot. <laughs> Again, not everything that Beethoven did seems to resonate with what we might think of an image of a charitable Christian. And again, I think it's worth mentioning that that, to some degree, is Beethoven's personality, but it's also a product of the period that he's living in. Beethoven is growing up in the era of the Freemasons and the Illuminati, where people are sort of gravitating away from traditional doctrine. I think it's also important to point out that probably Beethoven's most religious piece is the Ninth Symphony. Wait a second, the, the Ninth Symphony, that doesn't mention Jesus. It doesn't mention uh, the, the text of the Mass, Gloria in excelsis Deo, Glory to God in the Highest. It doesn't mention, you know, Dona nobis pacem, give, grant unto them peace. It doesn't say, Agnus Dei, qui tolis peccata mundi, Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So why am I calling that a religious piece and why am I putting it in scare quotes? Well, I think we have to draw a distinction with Beethoven between religious and spiritual. Beethoven, was he religious? Was he what we call an in the, queue, in the pews Catholic? No, he was not. Did he behave in a way, not just with his sister-in-law, but in other episodes of his life that is at best morally questionable? Yes. Was Beethoven a deeply spiritual man? Well, it's hard to say, but I think most historians and most people who read Beethoven biographies would say yes. And where do we find that spirituality? It's not necessarily in a huge body of liturgical music, like Bach and his 200 cantatas, or his Passion Oratorios, or his five Fünfe Kleine Messe, the five small masses. It's not like Bach, or even like Mozart with his nearly 20 settings of the Mass ordinary. With Beethoven, we find it in the words of Friedrich Schiller. Alle Menschen werden Bruder, wo dein Sanfter Flugelwald. All men become brothers. Sei dum schlungen Millionen, diesen Kuss der ganzen Welt. Be embraced, you millions. This kiss is from the whole world. Über Sternen muss ein lieber Vater wohnen. Above the canopy of stars, a loving father must be dwelling. Hey, wait a second. Above the canopy of stars, a, a loving father must dwell. That sounds pan-religious, at least, right? There seems to be a reference, albeit an oblique one, to what we might think of as God, right? So, is the Ninth Symphony a religious work? I think it depends how we define religious. Again, if we're drawing a distinction between religious and spiritual, then no, it's not a religious work. Although, as we've seen, it does reference a creator, What's the, the line? Anest du den Schöpfer Welt? Do you sense your creator, O world? That's the word, of course, in German for creator is Schöpfer, as in uh, Haydn's Die Schöpfung, which is the creation, which is an oratorio by Haydn, probably his most famous uh, work involving voices. So Beethoven is using poetry that references a creator, seems to allude to a god dwelling above the canopy of stars up there in the firmament. But there's no mention of Jesus. There's no mention of the taking away of our sins. There's no mention of exalting God and praising God in the highest. God is described as a father, which I think suggests altogether different imagery. And I think if we consider Beethoven's works in their totality, perhaps it's the Ninth Symphony and not the Misa Solemnis that resonated most with him. It's hard to say for sure, but I think you could make the argument that it's the Ninth Symphony that really reflects Beethoven's faith. And that brings us into the Romantic period. Music is going to change dramatically here, and we're going to see some of that in this music, but not a whole lot. And I'm going to start out by explaining why that is. Writing liturgical music, writing music that is reflective of one's faith, one's religious convictions, tends to be 
something in music history where we look at the music and we see composers not writing avant-garde progressive music, but rather reflecting back on the past. I think we saw that with Mozart, didn't we? Mozart's Kyrie from the C minor mass, which we looked at last week, started not with some beautiful, dazzling, homophonic texture and a, and a lovely melody, but rather with a very complex and chromatic fugue. And we said that fugues, being part of the Baroque musical language, were out of fashion by Mozart's day. And if Mozart wrote that piece in 1783, then it's safe to say that fugues were out of fashion for probably half a century at that point. And yet Mozart goes to the fugue. Go to Mozart's, perhaps his other most famous liturgical work, which is his Requiem, 1791. How does he start that? Also with a fugue. And the fugue, just to remind ourselves, is a style of music based on imitation, where you introduce a theme, and that theme is echoed in a subsequent entry. And when that second entry comes in, the first voice is off to the races with something else, something complementary but independent. In other words, fugues are complex. And that, I think, explains, at least somewhat, why fugues, like tube socks, went out of fashion. <laughs> Not to say that tube socks are complex, but I think you follow. People in the 1730s, 40s, 50s wanted simplicity. And they got it. They got it in the piano sonatas, right? They get it in the operas where the texture is all based on a singer who's got that beautiful bel canto voice by the 19th century, and you've got a simple orchestral accompaniment that allows the singer chance to shine. That's where they got the new music. They got it in the piano sonatas. You listen to Mozart, and you get... Simple, direct. You get it in the piano music, but not in the C minor mass. The C minor mass presents us with music right off the bat, which asks a lot from us as listeners, and of course, a lot from the musicians who are performing it. So composers, both Mozart and Beethoven, are really looking backward when they're writing liturgical music. Are they not? We've seen that in Mozart's C minor mass. We see it in his Requiem, which starts with a double fugue, not just a single fugue, he ups the ante, dials up the intricacy, the complexity, and writes a double fugue. We see it in Beethoven with the Credo, which we looked at briefly last week from the Misa Solemnis, which also begins with imitation in the voices. Now, Beethoven's style is very fluid, and as we saw in that particular movement, very bombastic, asking a tremendous amount from the singers. Complexity is dialed up to 11, if you will, certainly by the standards of 1821. It's dialed up to the max. And we can only imagine that those performances, by the way, when those pieces were premiered, must have been sloppy. We know, for example, that Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, when it was premiered December 22, 1808, was sloppy. It just was, because Music of that difficulty had not been written yet. And Beethoven's opening up the door in a way. Music of the Romantic period, it's hard to sum it up in any one concise sentence. But let me introduce a couple of ideas which I think typify music of the Romantic period. Number one, chromaticism. Chromaticism refers to this idea where the music is going to move in smallest possible increments, what we call minor seconds or semitones. And it has a characteristic sound. Many of you will recognize it instantly. It's the sound of that sort of sound. And when we talk about chromatic music, what we're usually referring to is music that introduces tones that don't belong to the key. So if I'm in C major and I play, that sounds like all those notes are converging on C, does it not? In the Romantic period, composers start to introduce tones which simply don't belong to C major. It's really hard to demonstrate that because this sort of cadence is 
is a very Baroque or classical style cadence. In the Romantic period, you're going to get notes that don't belong. What happens if I'm in C major? Well, that sounds like something out of a jazz idiom almost, doesn't it? That doesn't exactly sound like romantic music. Where we would see it in romantic repertoire, for example, would be in the works of Wagner. In Wagner, you get chromaticism dialed up to an extreme degree, so much so that some of his music sounds incoherent to some listeners because it avoids, I should say, Wagner has the music avoiding sounding like it belongs to any one key. See, of course, the example that always comes to mind. The prelude to Tristan and Isolde. I'm speeding up quite a bit now. Do you hear that level of chromaticism? moving in semitones and avoiding sounding like it's rooted in any one key. Some listeners find this enchanting, others find it nauseating. Clara Schumann was famously in the latter category when she was asked, Frau Schumann, what do you think of Herr Wagner's work? She was at the premiere in 1865 and Clara Schumann apparently replied, I had no idea that something so repugnant could be composed. All of this takes us to the man whose face should be on screen right now. And perhaps we might ask Jackson why he's not manifesting. I think when Mallory came over, uh, the screen went out. So, Well, if we were looking at the screen right now, if you could see what I see, do you see what I see? You would see the face of Giuseppe Verdi. Verdi is a hard composer. To, uh, to analyze in this context because he's not really someone who conjures up liturgical music, is he? Of course, there are some things about him that seem obvious. So, for example, Verdi is Italian. That's obvious. And, of course, that means that from a perspective of categorizing him in terms of his faith, he's squarely in the Roman Catholic camp. But he was not a very religious person. Some people might know that Verdi lived during the entirety of the 19th century. In fact, he was born 1813, dies 1901. So makes it all the way through the century, and by the way, remains active as a composer really throughout the, the entire century. He writes Otello in the late 1880s, and then his final opera, Falstaff, I think in 1893. So this is a guy who's writing operas like a dynamo throughout the century. And it's fair to say that if you look at any opera database, that tracks performances around the world, certainly around the country, but in Europe, you would find that a great majority of operas that are performed are ones that are composed, have been composed by Giuseppe Verdi. And so what does this have to do with liturgical music? How does Verdi fit into this discussion of music and faith? Well, Verdi did write a very important work that involves faith, spirituality, meditation, all of these things converge, coalesce in his Requiem, which he probably started working on in the late 1860s, but was not performed until the 1870s. We're going to talk about why. A Requiem is a Mass for the dead. So it will have certain things in common with the Masses we looked at last week. For example, it will often have a Kyrie and a Christe. So Kyrie eleison, Christe eleison. Lord have mercy. Christ have mercy. This is the part of the Mass ordinary text, which is actually not in Latin, but rather in Greek. It's all Greek to me, right? Well, now you know a little bit of Greek, but not, not very uh, useful Greek, I'm afraid, unless you happen to be in church, in which case, then be very useful. Kyrie eleison, Christe eleison. Are you going to have a Gloria in excelsis Deo, in a Requiem? Think about that. Gloria in excelsis Deo means glory to God in the highest, et in terra pax hominibus bone voluntatis, and peace on earth and goodwill towards men. Does that sound like something you would include in a requiem? Of course not. 
right? In Requiem, Danke schön, or should I say uh, Grazie mille. <laughs> so we're not going to have the Gloria, which is the traditional second movement of the Mass. Instead, we're going to get a text that invokes judgment, that invokes, invokes the world dissolving in ashes. That's what the text says. The text is Dies ire, dies ila, solvet seclum in favila, teste David cum Sibila. Oh, that day, that day of wrath, when the world is dissolved into ashes, just as David prophesied to the Sibyls. The Sibyls are sort of the, uh, the oracles of Greek mythology. So it's mixing language here, mixing, mixing uh, some of the, the origin of this text. And composers, historically, took this Dies Irae text and made it a focal point of their requiem settings. I think someone that comes to mind, because he wrote a very famous requiem, or at least part of one, is Mozart. So we're going to start out by looking at Mozart's setting of the Dies Irae from his 1791 Requiem. Remember, Mozart never finished his Requiem. He died while he was working on the Lacrimosa. The Lacrimosa, of course, comes uh, from the same Latin root as the English word lacrimate, which means to cry, to weep, to shed tears. So here is, uh, here is a picture of Verdi. Um, and of course, we have photographs, which is nice. We don't have any photographs of Mozart uh, the camera dates from the late 1840s, and as such, anybody who made it past the 1840s, we have actual photographs and not just paintings. So, pretty remarkable uh, way to contextualize our study of music history, to think about Verdi living into this era of uh, photographs and cameras. Later on, we're going to look at Brahms. You could tell beards were really in, in the 19th century. Um, and if we were to look at a picture of Wagner, which we certainly wouldn't today, but you would see Wagner had a very unusual beard, sometimes called the neck beard, where they would shave the whole front of the face and just grow this. So anyway, like I said, beards were in. All right, we're gonna. I'm actually gonna bring up uh, Mozart's the Dies Irae, and here is the score, which I think will help us keep up with the text. Remember, the text here means day of wrath when the world is dissolved in ash. Right? It's very short, about two minutes, and it's, uh, like most DSERA settings, filled with energy, some dissonance, and uh, a lot of intensity. Mozart's setting of the DSERA, very famous, been used in television commercials and, and uh, things like that where you wouldn't expect it but used to suggest intensity. And of course, the text first discusses the day of wrath, the day of judgment, when the world will be dissolved in ash, and then goes on to say, I tremble at that judgment. I tremble when I contemplate the future, when the great and mighty judge will render his judgment on us all. And Mozart, of course, sets it cleverly on the line, quando tremor, when I shake, we get the basses going, Wando tremor. They're literally sort of shaking, uh, and you can see that in the score. Verdi, I think, is going to outdo even Mozart with his setting of the Dies Irae, probably the most famous part of this, uh, of this Requiem. When we talk about Verdi's Requiem, and any Requiem, there's usually a genesis to the piece. There's usually some catalyst which somehow sparks an interest in the composer where they want to or they feel moved to write a reflection because ultimately that's what a requiem is, right? When you write a requiem mass, you are writing it typically for someone who has died. And in this case, the person that seems to have been the catalyst for this requiem was none other than famous Italian opera composer Rossini. Rossini died in 1868, and Verdi had this idea, and he wrote to his publisher, a guy by the name of Ricordi, and he says, why don't we do this? Let's get all of the great composers of Italy, and everybody will contribute one movement of the Mass. They'll set some part of the Requiem, and we'll get a great sort of uh, Misa per Rossini, a Mass for, for Giacchino Rossini, and it'll be a wonderful sort of testament to, uh, to all of our admiration for this great titan, this pillar of Italian culture. 
And of course, he starts working on it, and he writes a movement. We're going to listen to the Liberame. And nothing comes of this whole project. There are logistical problems. Some people aren't writing. Some people are, are dragging their feet. And of course, there's money issues. How do you, who's going to get paid? Who's going to have it performed? Who's going to get the attribution? Well, I want to write this section. No, I'm going to write the, uh, the, this section. I'm going to write the Kyrie, but you can write the DS here. So you see, it's, it's problematic to have these collaborative enterprises. This is why Wagner, by the way, would articulate in a, a document that he wrote in the in 1850s called uh, Die Kunst und Revolution, Art and Revolution, where he writes about this concept of the Gesamtkunstwerk. For Wagner, in order for a work to be unified, Gesamt in German, it has to spring from one mind. You can't share the responsibilities with other people because no artist is going to have the same vision that you have. And of course, Verdi tries to get the Misa, Misa's mass, of course, tries to get the Misa for Rossini, and it is not happening. It stagnates, the project eventually flops. And it wouldn't happen until um, about six years later when Verdi would decide, you know what, I'm going to write the whole thing myself, and he does. And um, this is at a time, by the way, Verdi, you have to remember, by the 1860s, 1870s, he's not just a great composer. He's an Italian hero. He's an icon. Why? Not just for his operas, but for the sort of message that's embedded and was read in, the, in between the lines of his operas. For example, the opera Nabucco, Nebuchadnezzar, the story of Babylonian captivity. How does Act II end with the chorus Va Pensiero, chorus of the Hebrew slaves? Now, why are Italian Catholics in Milan so interested in the Hebrew slaves striking off their chains on stage? Because they saw themselves on stage. You see, Italy was not a united country ruled by a sovereign government. In Italy was a collection of city-states with a lot of outside interference from other European powers, especially the French at this point. Previously, it had been the Austrians. And Italians said, basta! Enough. We want free Italy. We want King Emmanuel. We want a united, consolidated, autonomous, sovereign Italy. So what did they chant? Verdi. Verdi? Viva Emmanuel, re d'Italia. Long live Emmanuel, king of Italy. Well, it just so happens that that acronym is also Verdi's name. So he, he became people... Uh, celebrated Nabucco. This is 1840s. You know, Verdi's in his 30s. He's a young guy. And he becomes swept up in this political movement called the Risorgimento. So he's a national icon by the time he writes this Requiem. And we're going to jump in now and look at his Dies Irae. Verdi begins with thunderous G minor chords. Womp, 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 womp. And then we hear piccolo and brass and drums and most of all, perhaps, violins. Crazy violins playing this, this uh, figuration which separates the wheat from the chaff, you might say. In other words, it's played so fast, you look at these notes on the page, you think, how do you even execute that? But, of course, good violinists can pull it off. And when the chorus comes in, it's, it's uh, bass and tenors rising chromatically. Remember, we use that word chromatic, meaning by semitones. And they're going to come in, and you, they're going to sing this dissonant against the G, which is sustained in the bass. Do you hear that? So we start. And it goes on like that. It's going to start to change keys. Chorus is going to alternate between thunderous, tremendous intensity, and sometimes dialing it back to a whisper quiet, still intense, but now a whisper quiet sort of mu music, which is framing words, again, about judgment. So there's great terror, you might say, great fear, trembling in the music. 
and it's going to be dissonant at times. He's going to maneuver between different diminished seventh chords. Diminished seventh chords are chords which have a sort of instability to them. So we get this one over a G pedal. Now this one. You hear that? One more. And then this chord. So a lot of sort of maneuvering in chromatic space and a lot of deployment of instrumental forces which were not available to Mozart. For example, you'll hear prominent piccolo writing, prominent percussion writing. Mozart doesn't write for the instruments because nobody's writing for the piccolo in 1791. Nobody. You know who the first composer to include piccolo in a symphony was? It's Beethoven. It's at the last movement of the Fifth Symphony. It's got a piccolo part, the first time we see a piccolo, which of course is like a flute, but it's not like a flute. It's an octave higher, so it means it's going to have a shrill sound, that wind sound which is up in the highest register that a wind instrument really can play in. So you hear that, um, and you'll hear the chorus, which is going to be much bigger than the chorus that would have performed a mass in Mozart's day. Chorus in Bach's day, musicologists go back and forth. There are some musicologists who who think, they're, for example, a colleague of mine in Boston, Joshua Rifkin, says, one on a part. Well, try singing the B minor mass one on a part and come, come talk to me after you're done. Um, I think most people say four on a part would have been typical for Bach. So 16 singers in a Bach choir. Mozart, perhaps not more than 30. Beethoven, maybe as many as 80. For Verdi, really depends. I've seen it done with 300 singers or more. So there's a bigger sound, more instruments, and, uh, and more singers. So let's look at Verdi's Dies Irae. I'm going to pause it there. We've listened to a scant minute and 30, but it's a very memorable, very striking minute and 30 seconds of music. Verdi, again, somebody we associate almost exclusively with opera. And why not? When you've got one name that can be attached to Rigoletto, Traviata, Trovatore, Otello, Falstaff. So many of the great operas in the repertoire are by this one person. We don't associate him with liturgical music. However, we have this piece as, as a testament to his skill in that genre. We're not done with Verdi yet. We're going to move on very uh, briefly. I want to talk about the end of this Requiem. We get this movement which Verdi had originally written as his contribution to the, remember the Rossini Mass? This would be the Requiem for Rossini. So if the original movement that he had written was the Liberame, and the text, Liberame Domine de Morte Eterna, liberate me, O Lord, free me from it, this death, from this eternal death. And then he goes on to talk once again about, about judgment. When the great judge shall essentially render his decision. And this particular movement became intertwined with a very interesting bit of history in the 1940s. Of course, the 1940s is a time that, especially in the first half of the 1940s, we associate with the Second World War and with the Holocaust. Now, how does Verdi, what does he have to do with the Holocaust and the concentration camps? As it turns out, there was a camp in what nowadays would correspond to Czechia or the Czech Republic. And uh, this is not too far, maybe an hour and change drive outside of Prague. This particular camp was known as Terezin, or the Germans called it Theresienstadt. And this was sort of a show camp, a propaganda camp, where you could show the Red Cross and other international authorities. You see, yeah, you know, the, the concentration camps aren't so bad. Look, they have culture here. They have art here. Uh, they have shows. They have string quartets. Um, this was one of the objectives of the Theresienstadt camp. It was a, served as a propaganda camp, and of course for the Nazis in 1944, especially served as a transit camp so that they could move the last, in the last phases of the final solution, move as many people to the death camps as they could. In German, there's a distinction, of course, between Konzentrationslager, the concentration camp, and the Vernichtungslager, the extermination camp. And we're going to talk about both now briefly. 
It was a, a Czech gentleman by the name of Raphael Schechter, who was a conductor and a composer and Jewish. Of course, he was rounded up after the Nazis occupied this part of Europe and he was sent to Terezin, or Theresienstadt. And there, with only a piano vocal score and an out-of-tune dinky piano in an old must musty cellar, he taught over 150 inmates the music of the Verdi Requiem, which they learned by rote. They didn't have scores, so they had to learn every one of the four parts by rote. And they performed it over and over again. Schechter was... Unfortunately, in 1944, in October of 44, he was deported to Auschwitz. And from there, he actually survived uh, until the end of the war and died on a death march, we think. Nobody is quite sure, but he may have been one of the many starved and emaciated people who could not keep up, fell by the road, and died on the infamous death marches. We get back to Verdi and the Requiem. Why Verdi's Requiem? What does it mean for Verdi's legacy? What does, how is this particular wrinkle in the history books impacted the appreciation of Verdi's Requiem. I think perhaps you could make the argument that it's intensified the appreciation of the Requiem. In fact, some of the survivors of Terezin, who of course are now quite elderly, the ones who are still alive, gave testimony that when they sang this piece, it was sort of an act of defiance against the Nazis. How? Why? Well, what's being discussed here in the text? Dies ire, dies ile, ila, the days of wrath, the days of judgment. In other words, hey Nazis, it's going to happen. The day will come for all of us, and you'll be there before the judge. And of course, we get this music in the Liberame, which very sets in the musical form that we've encountered with Mozart and with Beethoven and certainly with Bach. Can you guess what it is? It's a fugue. It's a fugue with a very unusual musical subject that bounces around through more than an octave. Let's listen to it here. We begin with a soprano soloist singing the words, Liberame Domine de Morte Eternam in Die Ila Tremede, on that great day, quando celi moventi sunt, when the heavens and the earth are moved. Liberate me. Notice again this connection to the singers in Theresienstadt move off from Verdi now, but just to go back to this, this text and this image of inmates in a concentration camp singing of all the works that they could have sung, to sing this seems to be especially resonant when you hear the, obviously, it's beautiful music, and when you consider the text, and of course, it's inconceivable that many Nazis would have understood what was being sung. But when it talks about the Creator judging the world in fire, right, per iniem, um, it makes for a very poignant picture. And when it ends, and all the voices of the choir, and again, the number that's usually bandied around is 150 singers, but that's when it started. The choir dwindled in size for obvious reasons. And to think about the way the music ends, with all four parts in unison, just singing at the quietest pianissimo. Dreaming. It makes the hair on the back of your neck stand up to think about that sort of image. By the way, there is a, a, um, an organization which is called the Defiant Requiem. And uh, they have done performances of the very Requiem it's an a non-traditional performance, and it's, uh, it's spliced with other uh, footage from the camps, from the, I should say from the camp from Theresienstadt, and interviews with survivors, just very brief quotes. And it ends with a solo violin playing uh, the melody of Ose Shalom, which is a, a Jewish liturgical melody. So it's, it's very powerful. I had a chance to see it at Lincoln Center in uh, 2013. And... Um, and that was when some of the survivors were still alive. I don't know how many are still some of the original choir members. It's just one. Yeah, is that right? Interesting. Mm. Well, all of this is to say that next time you think of Verdi, you can think of opera, but 
You can also think of the requiem, which is, I think, one of the brightest feathers in the proverbial cap of, uh, of the great maestro. When, you know, when Verdi died in 1901, the story, and the, you can see pictures, by the way, if you, if you Google it, that the streets were lined with mourners, that all of Italy seemed to be in mourning, um, that this great giant of Italian music had died. Speaking of giants of music, Johannes Brahms was born in Hamburg, of course, in the northern part of Germany, and therefore not Catholic, but rather Lutheran. And so one of the things we're going to see is that Brahms, also, by the way, not a, a particularly observant, devout practitioner of Christianity. Most of his music, I think when people think of Brahms, they think of his four symphonies. Singers might think of his leader, or perhaps his Schicksalsli, the Song of Destiny, or perhaps if you're a pianist, you might think of his Intermezzi, or maybe his Sonatas. People don't automatically think of Brahms as a composer of spiritual music, of, of religious music, but he too is famous for writing a very memorable setting of the Requiem. But Brahms' setting is very different than Verdi's. And this, I think, testifies to a certain flexibility in writing a Requiem Mass. Brahms, for example, is going to make some decisions which are very unconventional. If Verdi's Requiem, if we were to comb through the text and look at it, I think we would see that a lot of it has to do with judgment, right? As we've seen with the Dies Irae, with the Liberame. A lot of it has to do with facing your creator at the end when the last trumpet sounds and, ma and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, that sort of thing, which we find in Handel's Messiah, and we're going to hear it in German in a few minutes. For Brahms, the emphasis is not on the dead and the dead going to meet their maker and be judged. That's not what he's interested in really at all. I shouldn't say at all. I would say that the focus of the Brahms Requiem is on the living. It's on comforting the mourners themselves. One of the first lines, you know in the German, Selig sind die da leidtragen. Blessed are they, to leidtragen is hard to translate, but you might translate it very easily as something like, blessed are they who suffer. Or maybe more accurately, blessed are they who carry the burden of suffering. In other words, Blessed are they who have to bury the dead. May they be comforted. Denn sie sind getristet werden. They will be soothed. They will find the balm. So for Brahms, it's about meditation on the living and the impact of death on those who are still alive. Brahms' style is very tonally fluid. Brahms' melodies are famously singable, and the, the harmony remains, even when it modulates all over the place, the harmony remains, I think, as a singer, one might say that it remains very accessible. Your notes, essentially, are not too hard to find for much of this. The other big difference with the Brahms Requiem is that it's in German, ein deutsches Requiem. No composer, really, that we could think of, and, and composers had been writing Requiem settings in the Baroque period. There was a famous composer a couple of generations before Bach named Heinrich Ignaz von Bieber. No relation to Justin. Spelled differently. Bieber's Requiem stands, I think, for many who have had the chance to sing it as one of the great Requiem settings of the Baroque period. Mozart in the Classical period. Verdi in the Romantic period. Setting a mass seems to suggest just on the surface, that's going to be in Latin, right? Because as we've seen, it's associated with a sacrament, which is part of, is one of the main rites of the Catholic Church, of being a Catholic. That is to say, it's type of mass. And mass is part of life. That's part of your, your daily prayers if you're a very observant Catholic. So it seems to suggest that the text should always be in Latin. But Brahms, being a Lutheran, is going to set it in German. So we get lines like the one I said earlier, Selig sind die da leidtragen. That's the first thing that we hear. Not 
Kyrie eleison, not requiem eternam, nothing like that. It's blessed are they who carry the burden of suffering, but they will be comforted. Sie werden getrusted. They will be comforted. They will be soothed. We're going to look at the sixth and penultimate movement of this requiem setting. It's about, this is shorter than Verdi's. Verdi's is, um, you know, closer to two hours, whereas this is probably an hour to 70 minutes, maybe longer, depending on the conductor. Um, here, we're going to pick up on a text that may be familiar to those of you who are familiar with Handel's Messiah. And of course, Handel's Messiah, very popular this time of year, even though only part one really has anything to do with Christmas. Most of Handel's Messiah, you know, you get part one, which is, dwells a lot on, uh, on the Christmas imagery, a lot of text from Isaiah. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, God with us. If you look later in Handel's Messiah, part two is meditation to some degree on the passion, right? He trusted in God that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him if he delight in him. Well, if we go to part three, and yes, there is music after the Hallelujah Chorus. You see some people, they hear the Hallelujah Chorus conclude, they are great, now we can go home. No, you missed the best part. Part, th part three, or as Handel called it, Part the third has some of the best music in the oratorio. We're going to hear the same words that Handel sets uh, here in German. Handel sets the phrase, for example, um, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. We're going to hear it here in German. Sehr ich sage euch ein Geheimnis. Behold, I tell you a mystery, or a geheimness is like a secret. There are some problems in translation. For example, we'll, get, we'll hear the line, die letzte posaune, at the sound of the last posaune. Wait a second, what's a posaune? It's a, a trombone. The sound of the last trombone? Well, the word in German would be trompette, but it's not. It's posaune. So these, this is one of the examples of where you find discrepancies in translation. We're going to hear a section where the music becomes very animated and the chorus is going to sing. Eventually they'll get to the words. Um, der Tod, der, which means death, is, is uh, swallowed up in victory. And then you hear the words, Hell, where is, or death, where is thy sting? Hell, where is thy victory? In German, Tod, wo ist dein Stachel? Hülle, wo ist dein Sieg. Um, and this is going to lead into a fugue where the chorus sings, Herr, du bist würdig zu ihm. Lord, you are worthy of, of, of honor and glory and all that other good stuff. And again, we hear it in the form of a four-part fugue with beautiful string writing that complements. Here is the baritone soloist taking us zu der Zeit der letzten Posaune at the sound of the last trumpet or trombone. It's a very long fugue. For those of you who have sung it, you know how long it is. One of the most wonderful things about it is that Brahms takes a slightly different tack than Verdi, whereas Verdi chooses to make much of the choral exposition. That is to say, when the chorus starts the fugue, Verdi has it all a cappella. Did you notice that? It's just voices, and then the orchestra comes in for a hit. Bam, bam. Here, Brahms starts us off immediately with counterpoint. The fugue starts, and we hear the strings going. And if you look at the score, and you go back, this is sort of a very typically Brahmsian thing to encounter. We get this wonderful cross rhythm in the, between the chorus and the orchestra. Do you see these threes here? So while the chorus is going bam, 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 we have the orchestra doing playing those triplet patterns, three, which sometimes coincides against the two. And it gives us this wonderful sort of rocking quality where you hear the two different, altogether different rhythms being articulated in the different sections. Let's listen to that again. And um, it's right, the, the sopranos, as they often do, are going to lead us in with uh, a resolution of the leading tone. A man we're going to talk about next week, although I promise just briefly, Arnold Schoenberg famously wrote uh, an article about Brahms, and it had a very unlikely title. It's called Brahms the Progressive. 
progressive. Brahms? Well, isn't his reputation as the keeper of the classical flame? This is the guy who, in an era of crazy program music, is writing straightforward symphonies with no psychedelic stories. Just symphonies, just beautiful music meant to be appreciated for the configuration of the sounds and the timbres of the orchestra. He is, in many ways, the successor to Beethoven, that conservative keeper of classical, uh, the classical templates, you might say, sonata forms, symphonies, chamber music. And yet Schoenberg called this article Brahms the Progressive. And I think we see in this page right here, just in this screenshot, a lot of what makes Brahms more progressive than he's sometimes given credit for. And it's in his sense of rhythm, perhaps most egregiously, most saliently, we see it in his rhythm, which has this. Sometimes it makes you feel very off kilter. And then when it comes together, when you get it, it has a, a wonderful interlocking quality. And, um, and uh, this is one of the things that we really associate with Brahms, concepts like hemiola notes that are stretched across bar lines to suggest other meters, or sometimes just meters that are in direct conflict. Um, and it's the conductor's job to have to manipulate it all. Speaking of conductor's jobs, next week we're going to talk about one of the most famous conductors of the 20th century, Leonard Bernstein. Of course, Bernstein was the trifecta. He was conductor, composer, and pedagogue. And we're going to talk about him next week. When we look at his Chichester Psalms, a manifestation of liturgical music in the 20th century, a setting of a language we haven't looked at yet, but a very important language, of course, when it comes to music and faith, and that is Hebrew. So next week we'll answer some critical questions like, how do you notate music when the words are in Hebrew? After all, music goes left to right, Hebrew grows <laughs> right to left. Well, there's an easier solution than you might think. Um, what are some of the things we might expect to encounter in 20th century music? Well. We know that it's not always easy to listen to this music. And we could have looked at any number of examples. For example, Arnold Schoenberg wrote a setting of the Kol Nidre, text that we associate with Yom Kippur. We could have listened to that. Well, I've chosen Bernstein for a couple of reasons. Number one, because he would have turned 100 this year, as many of you know. So it's been a year, I think, in general, where there's been a lot of reflection on Bernstein's works. And second, I think the Chichester Psalms are a wonderful example of how a composer can weave in a modern style which has sort of bended and sometimes fluid and ambiguous nebulous tonality, which we associate with the 20th century, and still maintain wonderful melodic character which singers and audiences can access and appreciate and have it lingering in their heads the same way you might have a melody from a Mozart aria lingering after you hear it. Bernstein gives us really something very special in a piece which lasts no more than 20 minutes. But when the chorus sings at the end, the words of the psalm, Hine matov umanaim shevet achim gam yachad, which means how nice it is, lo how beautiful and how nice it is to dwell together as brothers. I think not only is it beautiful music, but it's a beautiful message for us to end this program series with. So next week, we'll look at music by Leonard Bernstein, and we'll focus on the Chichester Psalms. We may also have some time to look at his Kaddish Symphony, which also, of course, Kaddish is a, a, a prayer for the dead, um, and it's in Aramaic of all languages. So that gives us even more of, you know me, I love languages, and, um, and we get to look at even more of that next week when we look at Bernstein's Chichester Psalms. So thank everybody for coming out tonight. And thank you for, uh, for sharing this special time to just meditate and listen to the music of Verdi and Brahms. And um, if anybody has any questions, I know some people have to go, but I, I'd be happy to take a, a few questions. Yeah, and who, who had that top C? I, it's, it's one thing to have a, a well-nourished um, professional soprano, but to think about who would have sung any of the solo parts, really, in Theresienstadt. Um, very hard to imagine how they pulled it off, but it's interesting when you watch the um, when you watch the Defiant Requiem. If you go to their website, they have a very short three-minute introductory video, and they have spliced in some clips from the uh, from the speakers who were interviewed. This 
survivors who sang in the 1940s. And uh, you, you can see the conviction on their faces when they're talking. And they're in their 80s or, or later when they're giving these interviews. Um, but there's a, a light there that you just you see it. So hard to explain how they were able to do what they did. But uh, it's very different to hear a professional who's, who's uh, you know, hydrated and, and healthy doing it now. Anyway, yeah, this was, it looks like a uh, recording from 1972 with uh, Herbert von Karajan. Hey, that gives us another interesting thing to talk about because as some of you know, von Karajan, his history is a little bit checkered, shall we say. And uh, if you go on YouTube, you can see videos of him in the early 40s conducting Wagner at Bayreuth with the swastikas draped uh, on either side of the stage. So Herbert von Karajan, I think somebody who... Uh, you could go back and, uh, and point to some episodes in his life, which, to tie it back to where we started with Beethoven, uh, morally questionable at best. Um, of course, Karyan is considered one of the great conductors of the sort of middle of the 20th century, but um, I think there are some people who, who are not fans of his, and uh, it's sort of easy to understand why. This as opposed to someone like... Uh, Richard Strauss, who also had an, had an association with the Nazis, but um, as some of you know, ran afoul of the Nazis and, and ultimately wound up at at uh, um, in conflict with them, we should say. Anyway, um, I, I'd have to look and see who it is, but I chose this the video because um, the sound was good and it had a score with words that were easy to follow. Yeah, there's something nice about having a score. Even if you, one doesn't read music, it's amazing that we're able to pick up quite a bit of what we might call contour. So notes go up, notes go down. And that's really, if you wonder how music is constructed, that's really all it is. It's about relationships. And it's about notes that are either vertical, that is to say sounding together, or horizontal, one follows another. If one follows another, we call it melody. And if they're stacked vertically, we call it harmony. And that's, to a large degree, what, you know, if you were to distill music down to its simplest elements, that's what it is. So having a score where we're able to see both the vertical and the horizontal, yes, you may not, you know, know that it's an augmented sixth chord in the key of G flat major or whatever the, the craziness is. Yeah, it, we don't have to, to be able to follow it, right? We really don't. So these, these scores are a wonderful resource. Although next week we're going to watch a video which is, um, is going to present the actual singing with subtitles because this way we'll be able to understand the Hebrew. All right, thank you so much, everybody.